my old uh, colleague in the United States Senate, your distinguished senator, Senator Moss, President McKay, Mr. Brown, Secretary Udall, Governor, Mr. Rawlings, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your welcome. And I'm very proud to be back in this historic building and have an opportunity to say a few words on some matters which concern me as president and I hope uh, concern you as citizens. The fact is that I take uh, strength and hope in seeing this monument, hearing its story retold by Ted Morse, and in recalling how this state was built and what it started with and what it has now. Of all the stories of American pioneers and settlers, none is more inspiring than the Mormon Trail. The qualities of the founders of this community are the qualities that we seek in America, the qualities which we like to feel this country has, courage, patience, faith, self-reliance, perseverance, and above all, an unflagging determination to see the right prevail. I came on this trip uh, to see the United States, and I can assure you that there is nothing more encouraging for any of us who work in Washington than to have a chance to fly across this United States and drive through it and see what a great country it is and come to understand somewhat better how this country has been able for so many years to carry so many burdens in so many parts of the world. The primary reason for my trip was conservation. And I include in conservation first our human resources and then our natural resources. And I think this state can take perhaps its greatest pride and its greatest satisfaction for what it's done, not in the field of the conservation and the development of natural resources, but what you've done to educate your children. This state has a higher percentage per capita of population of its boys and girls who finish high school and then go to college. Of all the wastes in the United States in the 1960s, none is worse than to have eight or nine million boys and girls who will drop out, statistics tell us, drop out of school before they have finished it, come into the labor market unprepared at the very time when machines are taking the place of men and women. Nine million of them. We have a large minority of our population who have not even finished the sixth grade. And here in this richest of all countries, country which spreads the doctrine of freedom and hope around the globe, we permit our most valuable resource, our young people, their talents to be wasted by leaving their schools. So I think we have to save them. I think we have to insist that our children be educated to the limit of their talents, not just in your state or in Massachusetts, but all over the United States. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who developed the Northwest Ordinance, which puts so much emphasis on education. Thomas Jefferson once said that any nation which expected to be ignorant and free hopes for what never was and never will be. So I hope we can conserve this resource. And the other is the natural resource of our country, particularly the land west of the 100th parallel, where the rain comes 15 or 20 inches a year. This state knows that the control of water is the secret of the development of the West and whether we use it for power or for irrigation or for whatever purpose, no drop of water west of the 100th parallel should flow to the ocean without being used. And to do that requires the dedicated commitment of the people of the states of the West, working with the people of all the United States who have such an important equity in the richness of this part of the country. So that we must do also. As Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot did it in years past, we must do it in the 1960s and the 1970s. We will triple the population of this country in the short space of 60 or 70 years. 
And we want those who come after us to have the same rich inheritance that we find now in the United States. This is the reason for the trip, but it's not what I wanted to speak about tonight. I want to speak about the responsibility that I feel the United States has, not in this country, but abroad. And I see the closest interrelationship between the strength of the United States here at home and the strength of the United States around the world. There is one great natural development here in the United States which has had in its own way a greater effect upon the position and influence and prestige of the United States almost than any other act we've done. You know what it is? It's the Tennessee Valley. Nearly every leader of every new emerging country that comes to the United States wants to go to New York, to Washington, and the Tennessee Valley because they want to see what we were able to do with the most poverty-ridden section of the United States in the short space of 30 years by the wise management of our resources. What happens here in this country affects the security of the United States and the cause of freedom around the globe. If this is a strong, vital, and vigorous society, the cause of freedom will be strong and vital and vi vigorous. And I know that many of you in this state and other states sometimes wonder where we're going and why the United States should be so involved in so many affairs in so many countries all around the globe. If our task on occasion seems hopeless, if we despair of ever working our will on the other 94 percent of the world's population, then let us remember that the Mormons of a century ago were a persecuted and prosecuted minority, harried from place to place, the victims of violence and occasionally murder, while today, in the short space of a hundred years, their faith and works are known and respected the world around, and their voice is heard in the highest councils of this country. As the Mormons succeeded, so American can succeed. If we will not give up, or turn back. I realize that the burdens are heavy, and I realize that there's a great temptation to urge that we relinquish them, that we have enough to do here in the United States, and we should not be so busy around the globe. The fact of the matter is that we, this generation of Americans, is the first generation of our country ever to be involved in affairs around the globe. From the beginning of this country, from the days of Washington until the Second World War, this country lived an isolated existence. Through most of our history, we were an unaligned country, an uncommitted nation, a neutralist nation. We were by statute as well as by desire. We had believed that we could live behind our two oceans in safety and prosperity in a comfortable distance from the rest of the world. And the end of isolation consequently meant a wrench with the very lifeblood, the very spine of this nation. Yet as time passed, we came to see that the end of isolation was not such a terrible era or evil after all. We came to see that it was the inevitable result of growth, the economic growth, the military growth, and the cultural growth of the United States. No nation so powerful and so dynamic and as rich as our own could hope to live in isolation from other nations, especially at a time when science and technology was making the world so small. If it took Brigham Young and his followers 188 days to go from winter quarters, Nebraska, to the valley of